Hey, what's up, YouTube? So in the last video, I introduced the row reduction algorithm, which provided a method for transforming any matrix into a row equivalent matrix in reduced echelon form. And now in this video, we're going to see how we can use this algorithm to find an explicit description of the solution set of a linear system. Now before we start, you might want to pause the video here to review these definitions and theorems introduced in the previous videos, because we'll be referencing the stuff written here throughout this video. So the top part here is just the row reduction algorithm. This is a theorem that tells us that the reduced echelon form of a matrix is unique. And then these are some important definitions that we'll be referencing throughout the video. Okay, so let's get started. First, let me introduce some new terminology. We say that an unknown variable of a linear system S is called a basic variable if it corresponds to a pivot column in the augmented matrix of the system S. And otherwise, we say that the variable is called a free variable. So let's look at an example. In this example, we want to determine the basic and free variables for this linear system, so we need to find the pivot columns of the augmented matrix of the system, which is given here. Now to find the pivot columns, we'll need to find the pivot positions, which remember are the locations corresponding to a leading one in the unique reduced echelon form of the matrix. And so we can find these pivot positions by working through the row reduction algorithm. So first, since we have that this column is non-zero, we know that our first pivot position will be located at the top of this column. And now let's just select this one that's already in the pivot position to be our pivot, and then we'll use this one to create zeros in the two spots below it. So first, to make this a zero, We'll replace the second row with the sum of itself and negative three times the first row. Then we'll get a new matrix with this new row two. Next, to make this a zero, we'll replace the third row with the sum of itself and negative two times the first row. And that will give us a new matrix with this new row three. So we end up with this matrix in echelon form. And now from here, we could continue row reducing this matrix until we end up with the reduced echelon form. But for the purpose of finding the pivot positions, an echelon form is sufficient. Because if A is a matrix in echelon form with R non-zero rows, then we know that A will have R pivot positions, where the pivot positions in A are precisely the locations in A that correspond to a leading entry of a non-zero row. And this is true because of the general form of an echelon matrix. To see what I mean, consider an echelon matrix, like the one shown here, where the squares represent the non-zero values of the leading entry of each non-zero row, and the stars are just arbitrary real numbers. Now we can always use the scaling and replacement row operations to make each leading entry equal to 1, and to make it the only non-zero entry in its column. And doing that, would give us the reduced echelon matrix of this form, where now we can see that the pivot positions are located in this position, this position, and this position. And now you can see that these are the same three positions that the squares were in over here in our echelon matrix. So you can see that we don't need the reduced echelon form of a matrix to find its pivot positions. We only need an echelon form of the matrix. So back to our example, since these are the three leading entries for each of our three non-zero rows, we get that these are our three pivot positions. And so the first, third, and fifth columns are the three pivot columns. Now the unknown variables that correspond to the pivot columns are x sub 1 for the first column, x sub 3 for the third column, and x sub 5 for the fifth column. So x sub 1, x sub 3, and x sub 5 are the three basic variables of this system. Now the other variables that are left are x sub 2 and x sub 4. So these are our two free variables of the system. And with this we're done because we've determined the basic and free variables. Now that we've seen an example, let's discuss why basic and free variables are important to the study of linear systems. So recall from earlier videos in this series that we had two big questions regarding linear systems. The first question we wanted to be able to answer about a general linear system was if the system was consistent, meaning it has at least one solution. And if so, we wanted to know if the solution was unique. Well, it turns out that with the use of basic and free variables, we're able to answer both of these questions by looking at an echelon form of the augmented matrix of the system. The following existence and uniqueness theorem illustrates this point. The existence part of the theorem says that a linear system is consistent, meaning a solution exists, if and only if the rightmost column of the augmented matrix is not a pivot column. Equivalently, we say that a linear system is consistent if and only if an echelon form of the augmented matrix has no row of this form for some non-zero constant b. And you can see intuitively why this makes sense, because if an echelon form of the augmented matrix for some system did have a row of this form, then a solution of the system would have to satisfy this equation, where the left-hand side of the equation is the sum of each variable multiplied by zero, and the right-hand side is the non-zero constant b. But clearly, the left-hand side is equal to zero, while the right-hand side is non-zero. So this statement is false no matter what values we choose for the unknown variables. So it's clear that a linear system could never be consistent if an echelon form of its matrix had a row like this. Now moving on to the uniqueness part of the theorem, it says that if a linear system is consistent, then the solution set contains either a, a unique solution when there are no free variables, or b, infinitely many solutions when there is at least one free variable. So if we go back to our example from earlier where we found this echelon form of the 
augmented matrix. Then, since this matrix has no row whose leading entry is in the last column of the matrix, we know that this system is consistent, so it has at least one solution. Now, using the uniqueness part of the theorem, since the linear system is consistent, and since this echelon matrix does have free variables, we get that this linear system has infinitely many solutions. So we have that this echelon matrix represents a consistent linear system with infinitely many solutions. Now, if we instead considered a linear system represented by this echelon matrix, then since these are the three leading entries of the three non-zero rows, and since this last entry is in the rightmost column, making it a pivot column, the existence part of the theorem tells us that the corresponding linear system is inconsistent. And now lastly, if we consider a linear system represented by this augmented matrix in echelon form, then since these are the leading entries for each of the three non-zero rows, and since none of these entries are in the rightmost column, the existence part of the theorem tells us that the corresponding linear system is consistent, and further, since every column of the coefficient matrix is a pivot column, making every unknown variable a basic variable, we know that there are no free variables for the system, and so the solution is unique. Now these three examples really illustrate how much we can learn about a linear system by only looking at the echelon form of the augmented matrix. But now if we get so much information from an echelon form, which is of course easier to find than the reduced echelon form of a matrix, then why is it that we care about the reduced echelon form? And one reason we care is because the reduced echelon form of a matrix is unique, whereas there will always be more than one echelon form of a matrix. Another reason is that once we obtain the reduced echelon form of the augmented matrix, then we've essentially solved the linear system. Whereas a matrix in echelon form would still require some work to solve the system. So for instance, let's go back to our first example and continue row reducing until we get the reduced echelon form. So starting with this column, we'll make this a zero by replacing the first row with the sum of itself and two times the third row, and that will give us this new matrix. From here, we'll move up and to the left to this spot, and now to make this a one, we'll multiply every entry in row two by negative one, and we'll get this new matrix. Now to make this three a zero, we'll replace the first row with the sum of itself and negative three times the second row, and then that will give us this reduced echelon matrix. So we started with this augmented matrix, and we obtained this row equivalent matrix in reduced echelon form. Now the linear system for this matrix is given by these equations, and we know that this linear system will have the same solution set as our original linear system since these two matrices were row equivalent, so we can solve the original system by solving this easier linear system. So to solve the system, we're going to give a parametric description of the solution set, where the free variables will act as our parameters. So we're going to get equations for the three basic variables, which are the x sub 1, x sub 3, and x sub 5 variables, and we're going to make it so that these equations depend on the free variables x sub 2 and x sub 4. And notice that the reason that we can solve for the basic variables here is because the reduced echelon form ensured that each basic variable was in exactly one equation in the system. So to solve for our basic variables, we can just move the free variables over to the right hand side. Then for the first unknown, we'll get this equation for the x sub 1 variable, this equation for the x sub 3 variable, and then the x sub 5 variable is just equal to 7. So now we can write the solution set as the set of all five tuples, where the second and fourth entries are any real numbers. The first entry satisfies this equation based on the values that were chosen for the x sub 2 and x sub 4 variables. The third entry depends on this equation, which depends on our choice of the x sub 4 parameter. And then the fifth entry will always be equal to 7. And so hopefully here you can see why we call them free variables. Because when we describe the solution set like this, then we're free to choose any value for these two free variables, x sub 2 and x sub 4. So for example, suppose that we chose 6 to be the value for the x sub 2 parameter and 0 to be the value for the x sub 4 parameter, then the values for the other entries will be determined by these two choices. So the first entry will be 40 minus 6 times 6, which is equal to 4. The value for the third entry will be negative 10 minus 0, which is just negative 10. And then the fifth entry is just equal to 7 like always. So this 5 tuple is a solution to our linear system. And we can verify this by plugging these values into our linear system. So if we plug in these values to the left hand side of each equation, we'll get these three expressions. And then when we sum the terms in each expression, we'll see that the first expression is equal to negative four, the next one is equal to negative two, and the last one is equal to negative one. And since these are the values from the right hand side of our three equations, we have confirmed that this five tuple makes each equation of the system true. And so it is one out of infinitely many solutions to the system. Now let me point out that anytime a system is consistent and has at least one free variable, the system will have infinitely many solutions, and there will be multiple parametric descriptions for the solution set. So even though we chose to describe it using the free variables as the parameters, this is not the only way to do it. For instance, we could take the x sub 1 and x sub 4 variables to be our parameters, then using the first equation here, we can solve for x sub 2 in terms of x sub 1 and x sub 4, and we would get this equation for the second entry, where this equation is now in terms of our x sub 1 and x sub 4 parameters. Now for the third entry, since this equation only relies on the x sub 4 parameter, the equation for the third entry will remain the same, and then the fifth entry was just a constant, so that will stay the same as well. So we get this different parametric representation for the solution set. And both of
of these describe the same solution set, they're just written in different ways. And we usually just adopt the standard notation, which is to write the parametric description in terms of the free variables. So now that we've shown how to find the solution set for this linear system, let's generalize this process so that we can find the solution set for any linear system. So here we've outlined a step-by-step -step procedure that we can use to find the solution set for any linear system. The first thing we do is write down the augmented matrix of the system. Next, we use the first four steps of the row reduction algorithm to obtain an echelon form of the augmented matrix. After that, we use the existence part of the existence and uniqueness theorem to determine if the system is consistent. If it's inconsistent, we stop there because we know the solution set is empty. If it is consistent, then we can proceed to the next step, which says to continue the row reduction algorithm to obtain the reduced echelon form of the matrix. Once we have the reduced echelon form, we can write the corresponding system of equations, and then we can rewrite each non-zero equation in the system so that the one basic variable in each equation is expressed in terms of any free variables appearing in the equation. Then once we do this, we'll have the expressions needed to write the solution set. And now with this, I think this is a good stopping point, but before I end the video, I'll leave you with this summary of some of the big things we talked about in this video, so feel free to pause the video here to review this. But that's all I have for now, so I'm going to end the video here. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.